welcome our friends from different countries in the world. So this is the afternoon time in Turkey, four o'clock. Now today is our uh, 16th week of uh, our Anatolia's online lectures, lecture series, together with uh, the Kadras University in Istanbul. So today we have a special guest from the United States, from the University of Massachusetts, Professor Muzaffer Wissal. Everybody knows him as Muzo. It's a nickname, but it's a, I think short way, I think shortcut to call Muzaffer Wissal as Muzo, okay? So he has been to US, I think for many years, so over than 40 years. And uh, I'm sure all the people uh, studying tourism all over the world knows him very well. So today we will talk about the future of tourism. Okay, so there are different speculations, different scenarios, you know, that we have been thinking about in, since, let's say, a couple, you know, for the last couple of years. But because of this pandemic, you know, there has been some additional uh, scenarios so that uh, the future of the structure of tourism research in, in the future may change in different ways. So Muzo is also one of the experts in this. Uh, in this field, doing a lot of you know uh, research uh, on different uh, aspects of tourism, uh, marketing, uh, management, and so on. Uh, yes, welcome, uh, yeah. Muzo. So, shall I call you as Muzo? Hoje? I'm happy uh, to be called Muzo, Muzaffer. So I've seen 25, 30 different versions of my name. So okay. it's okay. <laughs> uh, to you and uh, welcome again. Uh, so it's early morning in, in, in Massachusetts. Uh, so thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Uh, would you like to say something about yourself before we start? Sure. Uh, sure. Uh, 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 um, good morning. I guess it is uh, eight or eight here in the States and we may have uh, friends who may join us from different places. So we chose to uh, do this one in English. Uh, let me first thank uh, Professor Metin Kozak and Professor Nazmi Kozak for inviting me uh, to be uh, here with you. I'm very pleased. So um, um, uh, should I just start off with my education a little bit or? Yeah, well, yes, please, you know. Okay. That is an answer, I think. All right, so, oh, okay. Uh, well, um, as uh, Metin indicated, I've been in the States uh, for a long time. And um, uh, if I were to uh, look at my own, let's say, um, uh, historical evolution of my research and teaching, I could probably say a couple of things. And uh, uh, my own dissertation uh, focused on uh, forecasting in the beginning. I think this was a matter of, uh, convenience for me because there wasn't much going on at that time. And also uh, when I came to the USA, English was not my uh, uh, language. So it was my uh, second or third. So um, I thought it would be nice to deal with numbers than, you know, to deal with concepts. So I said, uh, what is the easiest uh, way of, you know, doing this? I said, maybe just, you know, doing something uh, in demand where I can use numbers, but um, the topic was also encouraged by my committee members who were well established at that time at Texas a &M. But anyway, so my early years, I guess, uh, really just looked at some of these demand issues as I uh, felt comfortable with the language and the field. And I said, well, looking at the uh, quantitative variables could be useful, but uh, there is the other side of the same coin where maybe um, less, you know, uh, tangible or uh, less quantifiable factors also play a role in influence and demand. So that was the kind of shift that I did um, from, let's say, you know, forecasting into a little bit motivation satisfaction. But the key, uh, uh, um, I guess, impetus behind all that was my affiliation with the National Park Service in the USA. And uh, I know uh, Professor Kozaks, uh, you would probably know that uh, I had a long uh, uh, affiliation with the National Park Service in the USA in the Southeast region that covered 11 states and then uh, US Virgin Islands as well. So as part of that um, affiliation, so even if you know I was a faculty member, so 
the National Park Service is part of the federal system. So as I did work, I would get compensated for it. But we've done a number of uh, um, uh, studies that looked at the uh, uh, visitor satisfaction to different national parks in the Southeast region, and from which I published some, but limited, but we had in-house you know, reports uh, with the chief scientists of the National Park Service. Out of that particular uh, uh, work, and we end up doing that book in 2010, uh, focusing on uh, satisfaction related issues. So I guess as things shifted and changed, uh, so, and, and you know, became senior faculty member or promoted, then I could afford to really dabble into a lot of other topics because uh, uh, even if you know, we're expected to develop some sort of expertise, but over time we had the luxury of, let's say, you know, going or reaching out into different uh, research areas. So depending upon who I work with, so I kind of expanded my portfolio of research, you know, focusing on different aspects of tourism and hospitality because, uh, you know, I guess after my initial first five year in the business, then I move into hospitality setting as part of the business school where I thought, you know, I can do better and then feel better about what I am housed. So I think for the... For the, for the past maybe 15 years or so, uh, as some of you may know, um, I have really just changed my focus to, uh, I guess, uh, move into a space where we can look at some issues uh, from the perspective of quality of life, life satisfaction, well-being, etc. This could be a matter of my, again, affiliation with uh, Joe Sergio, who is a faculty member, just retired at Virginia Tech well-known established scholar in the area of quality of life, I guess uh, being associated uh, <laughs> with the place and uh, in that environment. So, you know, whatever he had could, could have been or was contagious. So somehow he kind of, you know, uh, influenced uh, some of this. And we had a number of PhD students uh, with Joe and I co-chaired and fo who focused on uh, a quality of life issue. So I guess um, that shows that as times, uh, 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 as things uh, change over time, so did I in terms of the uh, uh, scope of, let's say, what we do as research. But I think uh, in a way, what I am focusing on uh, recently, this quality of life issues to me, is encompassing some of the things I've been doing for a long time. Because in my PhD seminars, we always talk about some of these things, uh, meaning quality of life issues, like broader policy related issues, for which there wasn't really much research in our space. So that's how I got into quality of life and tourism connection. Some of you may think that, well, there's some of that in leisure recreation, which is true. But at the same time, even some of the key books, seminal works, let's say, done in anthropology, even uh, 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 impacts of tourism, you know, some of these key books in the 80s, didn't even just, you know, mention a word about, you know, quality of life and its connection to the phenomenon of tourism. There wasn't really much discussion. So in that, I guess, uh, uh, opening that new venue of research allowed us to get better connected to policymakers, decision makers at the local level. And uh, for which we end up having a number of good funded projects uh, that we did it at the state level in different states. So I guess uh, in a nutshell, uh, uh, Professor Kozak, that has been a kind of my uh, evolution of, uh, let's say, research. Uh, but um, some of the things we did um, uh, could have been a function of, again, who I interacted with. Of course, some of you also had uh, some time with me and I was uh, honored to like, let's say, interact with the uh, Cossacks and also uh, Kemal Hoja is uh, here as well, Kantarji, others. So it was really uh, fun and it's been fun. So now, of course, uh, you know, whether I want or not, but I'm an administrator, so doing the best I can and mentoring our young faculty members and uh, still being active and doing even funded research on the site. Thank you, uh, Muzu. Well, uh, I know from, from your PhD thesis, I think you worked together with uh, Professor John Crampton. Yes. He used to be working on the same subject in the 80s. 
even he came from the PAC department like yourself in the, in the, in the, in the you know, following year. So he also, he's, I think the portfolio of uh, John Crapton's you know, publications also change to, I think, a, a different field like consumer behavior, decision-making or destination choice in the you know, 1990s. Then beginning from you know, early this century, he tried to publish some different type of articles, you know, so he's still active, but I'm not sure if he still publish, you know, papers and so on, but then you publish your, you know, part of your thesis, you know, on this modeling, uh, tourism demand and forecasting in good journals like Journal of Travel Research. So how can we connect now, you know, if there is a kind of, you know, yeah, shift from different you know, subjects to different ones in the last, let's say in your case, over the last uh, 35, 40 years, so how uh, can we define the nature or the type of research that tourism focused in the past? So we may start from, I don't know, from 50s, 60s, or even we may start from 70s. So how, what, 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 what kind of change we, we can observe, you know, in terms of the content methods or regions like, you know, uh, this this is a good question. It's funny though. Uh, when I start uh, maybe first week of PhD classes, this is one of the things we spend time on. Let me just uh, 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 back off a little bit. And you were talking about John Crampton, and um, a couple of years ago I was there at Texas A and M, uh, and he's still active and uh, uh, he's going full speed, no question. And I have. When I did my PhD, I guess even if I was in recreation tourism, because I had a chance to interact with Claire Gunn, uh, who is a pioneer in tourism planning, of course, uh, John Crampton, but I also had um, uh, Parashurman. And then uh, I don't know if you know, he's the one who developed a surf qual, remember? And then he was a faculty member at Texas A&M, and we call him Parshu, Dr. Parshu. So I had, I think, the best. Uh, dissertation committee one would ask for. So it was a little bit challenging and demanding, but I had a very powerful group of uh, uh, individuals uh, who served on my dissertation. So I was really pleased and honored uh, uh, to have you know, such distinguished uh, uh, individuals who helped me. I guess they probably influenced my uh, research and how I am grounded because at that time we were supposed to have at least two minors. So marketing was one of my minors and the other was, was uh, business analysis like management science. So uh, we had to have two other uh, uh, committee members representing our minor area. So my major in a way was grounded in tourism. But anyway, going back to, yes, uh, I met in uh, that historical perspective on tourism research, uh, knowing that uh, uh, in order to do that thing, I guess, let me just share, um, if I may, uh, one little slide that could probably give us a little bit more perspective. Can you see this thing, what I have here? Yes, yes. Uh, all right, let me just, um, in order to do that, uh, I don't know how much time I can spend on this, but hopefully maybe in 10 minutes even less, I can no, just- Until uh, the midnight. Oh, we do? No, well, I have a meeting <laughs> coming up at 10 o'clock my time, 10 to 30. But, okay, so I guess at least what I will say will reflect the nature of, let's say, tourism evolution or development in North America. You know, of course, uh, what I mean by that, uh, USA and Canada. And then to some extent, you can add... Uh, uh, Europe to it. So I guess some of you are in a better position to make that case for Turkey. But uh, any time, if I want to just, let's say, start uh, from the early 60s to present time in terms of different research issues, uh, characterizing, let's say, each decade, you know, what took place in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000 and onward. I think that's a good legitimate question for you know, uh, graduate students and uh, even young faculty members and PhD students. So in order to do that, at least I have to just have some elements uh, of inquiry that, that we can use to kind of uh, give, provide this perspective. The first thing would be, we have to have time element. As uh, Professor Kozak asked me, okay, let's do this one by uh, time, meaning over time. So we're talking about 50, 60 some years, right? And the second thing would be, how would they 
how would the issues be treated in each decade? That's a good legitimate question. What dominated, let's say, 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s, and what's going on in today's world, and what is likely uh, ahead of us, right? So I think how would that manifest itself? So what I mean by academic treatment, really just how do we get our um, knowledge you know, disseminated uh, in academic journals, non-academic journals, trade publication, et cetera. So we have to also keep that in mind uh, when we look at this evolution of tourism, development of tourism in terms of historical perspective. So dominant issues and academic treatment as measured or defined by types of journals that may exist in each decade. And then the other uh, issue would be, uh, I guess in a way we're talking about the epistemology of tourism, like you know, how do we know what we know and how that knowledge has been generated over time. So one of our, again, major contributors in the field, Jafar Jafar, whom you all know, had a you know, really excellent piece a while back where he talked about, let's say, you know, way of thinking and then our point of departure uh, when we look at, let's say, issues in tourism. So he came up with this uh, uh, four or five, you know, names to define, let's say, certain evaluation of, let's say, tourism development and, you know, from advocacy all the way to knowledge-based scientific platform, which will be part of this uh, historical perspective that I will provide you. And lastly, as you do this thing, uh, one may ask, okay, what are the uh, research paradigms, approaches that people may have used in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s to present time. So how would some of this change over time? And you can also relate uh, this in your, to take it to your own research space. So in a nutshell, I guess, if you look at uh, what happened in the beginning, so I'm talking about like the 60s, really, some of you may, may not know, before even 60s, let's just uh, ask the simple question. How did we know what we knew about tourism before 60s? So you're talking about here 40s and 50s. So my simple uh, response to it would be this uh, epistemological question at this time. So we have sources from which we can generate, you know, knowledge about tourism. I think those sources were typically, as you know, before the 60s, 50s, were maybe great travel books. Some of you may have read some of those. And then, uh, or you can just take a look at, you know, existing textbook, mostly in Europe at that time, you know, some of these classic early on tourism books. And then uh, maybe uh, scattered, you know, uh, studies in uh, classic discipline journals, let's say in geography, you may have seen one article in the 50s or in sociology, another article here and there. So there was no concerted effort where you can see this bulk of, let's say, tourism issues being discussed or disseminated. So in a way you can say before the 60s, the source of knowledge, the epistemology of tourism is grounded in existing literature but scattered all around. That's how I look at it. But if you look at the, uh, now the period of 1960 to 70, I guess in terms of academic treatment, that TR there is really to, to refers to actually tourist review. Later on that became tourism uh, review. And now it's a good journal, I guess, uh, uh, Bohalas is the editor of the journal, but that is probably the oldest uh, academic journal that I know of uh, in, uh, in, in, in our field. And that happens to be published at that time in Switzerland, I guess in a couple of different languages. Now, you know, it has evolved over time. But so then you, you, you have one journal in the 60s up until like late uh, uh, 60s, or even around 70s, and you have allied journals. So uh, meaning allied journals, you know, some of these pieces may popped up in classic journals, as I said, you know, recreation. Uh, geogra geography, recreation geography, geography journals, or some limited, you know, international trades or international uh, sociology journals, etc. So the platform in terms of, uh, if that's the academic treatment, very limited. So as Jafari once defined something like this advocacy, meaning from the perspective of providers, what we're trying to do is just promote, the more visitors you have, the better off you will be. The more you sell, the better off you will be. So the idea uh, 
uh, was just really to justify our own, our, our own existence. We call this thing you know, economic justification, which is the case for any field that goes over time, the beginning of any field, subject, where people, scientists, researchers, practitioners, try to justify their existence in the beginning. So how would you do that in terms of like issues you deal with? Really just, just like the product dominant logic type attitude. That's why we say promotion, selling, marketing. So when you think about it in that fashion, up until early 70s, you don't really think about the consequences of you know, consumption, meaning you know, what would tourism do or how would it you know, impact the environment, et cetera. So that advocacy is the impetus behind all this, let's say, commotion and what you see uh, in, 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 in tourism. Uh, or even to some extent in hospitality. So in terms of a research approach or a paradigm, so what are we gonna do? It's pretty much you know, exploratory in uh, nature, just like uh, quantification, but there isn't a much systematic way of you know, generating knowledge or understanding. So, but if you look at the move into, let's say a little bit uh, later on, so it's from the early seventies up until eighties. So at least in terms of time horizon and then uh, dominant issue. So there's a little bit shift going on from, let's say, uh, you know, having one journal now, all of a sudden, all these key journals that you know of now, Journal of Travel Research, Annals of Travel Research, Leisure Science, the Journal of Leisure, those are the key journals uh, that appeared in the 70s, mid 70s and early 80s, then you have tourism management, you know, more other journals application oriented. Initially, tourism management was introduced as a policy journal because there wasn't much going on in that area. Later on, it became like another generic tourism journal. But the issue here that, uh, so we have seen some changes, but the key issue, the key change in the 70s up until early 80s was in the area of understanding the consequences of tourism. So there is no longer, let's say, the so-called advocacy way of, you know, looking at issues. So there was no, you know, this uh, strict, you know, uh, product dominant logic where, you know, selling is the, you know, strategy. So then individuals, practitioners, even some academics started asking what's going on? How would these activities, you know, affect, let's say, uh, the space, the physical space, the cognitive space, et cetera. So now there was a movement towards, let's say, the so-called social and cultural impacts of tourism environmental impacts. That's why, uh, as Jafari, you know, called this thing, a, a, you know, cautionary type uh, platform where, well, we have to be a little bit careful about the way, you know, we do business. We cannot just simply, you know, promote, promote, you know, uh, the more people you have, the better off you will be. A classic example would be, uh, Acapulco in Mexico, you know, how it started in the 50s. And really, it's over the years, of course, it evolved into a beautiful, ma well managed, uh, you know, destination, but the beginning was terrible. So uh, just they kept building hotels, hoping that people will come, they didn't think about the indigenous, you know, people, the ecosystem, none of that uh, was part of their planning process at all. So therefore, later on, you know, they started just looking at the uh, carefully if they can just, you know, do some sort of intervention to kind of, you know, help, you know, those who are employed in the business. It was so bad that even uh, kids of the individuals, employees who work in this resort, you know, didn't really have access to good health system, good education, road, etc. So you're talking about uh, resort enclaves. So I guess you can see the logic and, you know, if you, and these were all, you know, venture capitalists, mostly, you know, from America and Europe, you know, who dominated, you know, hotel development without, you know, having a good master plan. So that's a really classic example, actually, what happened in that in the 50s and how Acapulco suffered from, you know, so-called unplanned development and later on innovation strategies. Now it is more managed and uh, they added a lot of things to improve, let's say, the well-being of, you know, workers, et cetera. So I think the 70s up until 80s had that strong, you know, maybe uh, emphasis on, uh, 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 on the impacts of tourism, whatever the type. So even some of the seminal work we see like classic books, uh, Jeff Wall, you know, had his book, uh, you know, around that time. So uh, the impact, impacts of tourism, et cetera. So if you move into, uh, and again, you know, here you have Cornell Quartel and Journal of Hospitality and Tourism Research, you know, early on during that time, those are the oldest uh, 
journals that, that existed in our field, then in terms of, let's say, research approaches, 70s, 80s, again, was dominated by descriptive uh, uh, justification and research, meaning they can only just explain, okay, you know, when you do descriptive research approach, you talk about measures of uh, central tendency and measures of uh, variation. You, by using those, you can just say, a graph and look at number of visitors. So you're talking about direction and magnitude, but not necessarily so what questions. So there was no so what questions, but the cheating, the kind of explosion, the major uh, uh, impetus uh, in this field, I think just started showing up in the late eighties around the nineties. So no need to get into this thing. We had tremendous, a significant number of new journals. So in terms of, let's say, topics being varied and how we treat, you know, some of these issues. Now we have so many different academic journals, even trade journals. I think the, the field was flooded with the journals in the 90s and then still it continues to this day. And I was told that there could be over 250 journals. I used to keep up with all this because I had a database. I'm sure Professor Nazma Kozak may keep up with all this, but it's impossible to keep up with this uh, number of journals in our field at this time. So what happened here, you know, as you look at even from the perspective of um, uh, consumer behavior, so you're talking about, you know, focus on uh, service economy and then, uh, uh, you know, Pine and Gilmer's book, you know, service economy and service dominant logic, like uh, Lush and Vargo, all those popped up in the, you know, like uh, around this time, 80s, uh, 90s, I mean, so slowly. So there was this, huge transition that is taking place. So then there was an almost really major shift from uh, the so-called product dominant logic to let's say service dominant logic where uh, non-economic value of our consumption became as important, not to minimize the importance of economic aspect of our consumption that mattered. But the, the change, you know, you talk about this ecotourism, we talk about this um, uh, niche tourism, uh, some of the more fancier environmental tourism, all those were productions of this development in the late 80s, around 90s. So if you look at some of those issues uh, I just provided there, we can see you know, what are the issues that kind of dominated, let's say, early 90s, like late 90s and early 90s, so the scope of our, I guess, um, uh, research uh, portfolio has really grown. I mean, it just significantly and, and, and became highly diverse, right? So, uh, and it was almost impossible one person or researcher, you know, to get a good handle of some of these highly complex issues. With that, of course, our um, uh, way of thinking or, or uh, approach to some of those issues was also different. So uh, naturally, you know, people talk about the so-called more from cautionary way of thinking to more of a appropriate way of, you know, doing tourism adaptance. Uh, this is where you talk about, let's say, you know, uh, you know, acceptable uh, uh, limits of use rather than, you know, physical or social, you know, psychological carrying capacity balanced development, sustainability, you know, those are just buzzwords that just, you know, pop into our uh, literature heavily. With that, of course, our uh, uh, way of uh, using research tools and techniques also got highly sophisticated, you know, from being, you know, early on exploratory, more of a descriptive number driven, and later on, you know, just we're talking about this more explanatory you know, causal, you know, relationship and trying to answer, so what, you know, and then uh, highly sophisticated, you know, uh, techniques, you know, of no need to mention some of those due to advancement in technology, etc. So most of us have become, you know, very comfortable with those uh, so-called, I call this thing, many driven, you know, software. And then when they had this thing early on, known SPSS, even SAS, Jump, whatever now open source are, I mean, some of those programs were pretty rough. And I remember the early development of SPS and SAS. Uh, one of the key professors was one of my statistical professors at Texas A&M. And it was rough, but over the years, they got so easy. Same thing with Lizard, SEM, et cetera, you name it. All these programs are just, you know, pull down option, 
type, you know. So, but the, the idea is uh, we have seen tremendous amount of uh, development and uh, maybe uh, in the area of both, you know, qualitative and quantitative uh, software uh, programs that uh, were, have became available to us, I guess, for us and, and to kind of, you know, just, uh, you know, facilitate our way of doing research easily. So uh, now the question is thereafter 2010 and beyond what's going on, I guess, uh, up until like 2010, one called this thing knowledge-based uh, scientific platform, but I think from thereafter, uh, it is up to you, however you label what's going on, but uh, in the area of technology, you know, we have so many different terms to do so, but one thing is clear. So we have come to a point where uh, I guess one can just simply say that uh, we're proud of the fact that we have come a long way in terms of uh, level of sophistication of our research tools, also in terms of sophistication of our knowledge pool, because tremendous amount of knowledge pool uh, we have created over this past 50, 60 years. Uh, and uh, also in terms of our own legitimacy, being a you know, legitimate sector, you know, like through the satellite account system uh, as part of the United Nations, let's say, or World Tourism Organization's recognition. So there is that kind of accounting uh, system or sector, just like agriculture, manufacturing, or tourism is a legit, legitimate sector. So therefore, our, let's say, uh, academic reputation or professional image has also improved over the years. So we're not the corner to justify our own existence. What do you do in this field? So I think we have come a long way in terms of sophistication and credibility. And then uh, so we're now at the point that, uh, you know, even uh, scholars from social and natural sciences, you know, tap into what we do and there's so much cross fertilization that is going on. I hope that kind of helps you uh, to, you know, just give you this uh, historical perspective in terms of how we approach certain things and what issues were dominated in each decade. Of course, you can chart out something like this for any country, any place and see what's going on. With this one, I just simply brought uh, Jafari's that platform way of explaining some of this and I added the other uh, dimensions to it to kind of just create some sort of a framework from which you know, I can just you know, talk about this historical perspective. So if you were interested in this, uh, those of you who are listening to us and I would be more than happy later on to share uh, my comments uh, in PowerPoint uh, with uh, Professor Metin Kozak and who can just share it with you. Okay. Thank you, Muzuvala. So let's, uh, I think you, you already uh, summarized what happens today. So, uh, I'll be a little bit discuss about the future of tourism research. So how can we connect all this information from the, you know, uh, the previous years and today? Yeah. How we can move it to the you know to the future. So, what kind of do you think uh, the changes may appear in the you know, be, you know together with this uh, the consequences of this pandemic and so on? So there are so, that, you know issues of change in teaching, doing research, and uh, there are also some kind of direct or indirect you know, influences on pressure on on academics all over the world, uh, not only in US, in, not only in Turkey, but from west to east. Uh, so we can uh, now see an increasing number of papers submitted to different journals. It is like a kind of booming, you know, uh, in, in terms of number, but uh, in terms of quality, we are not sure about uh, how they will impact, you know, to, to tourism uh, field in a post way in the future. So shall we get your, your opinions about this, Muzo? But this is a very, uh, you know, I mean, a good question. It has many aspects to it. Uh, uh, let me just uh, make one point. You're right. I mean, uh, one of the observations we have here is that uh, over the years, uh, the number of uh, publications we've seen is just has, I mean, just increased um, to the extent that, uh, you know, it's hard to believe that we will have that many or that much uh, uh, information out there. So the, the question to me is this, really, I mean, does it really matter if we have two more papers published? I think the point that I'm trying to make here is that the gap between, let's say, you know, uh, 
uh, knowledge generation as we see it in this academic journals versus you know knowledge that is really used by practitioners and the application of that knowledge right that gap still is big and um, but one of the things at least this is from my own uh, uh, research space and, and I feel very good about it. Uh, you know, this may not be reflected on my resume and what I do, and we don't even publish this thing, but I've been lucky enough to really just, you know, be in a place where we can do a lot of uh, good uh, application or oriented research. Like I mentioned this uh, National Park Service, we did a number of like uh, in-house reports for them that you would never see on my resume or anything else. Or, uh, you know, a friend of mine, we had this uh, service institute where we did a number of studies. For me, you reach some point in your life where you have to translate what you're um, uh, generating uh, into good use. So meaning, would your research be valued by anyone? I think that gap still exists, but in a lot of places, there is more support for this. And I, I also saw this thing, in Scandinavian countries where I had a partnership for a long time, I still do. And then there's so much support from these businesses, practitioners, even government that, that, that would be extended to academicians, that, that collaboration, valuing your, your, your work is so important, I think, or translating. You can do so much about, let's say, in this area of, let's say, performance measurement, but or developing sustainable indicators I think at some point, you know, some of these services have to be well tangibilized. This is one of the gaps that I see. Otherwise, you know, I look at, you know, your publication, my publication in this good journal, in that good journal, that's like a number game. It does not really add much to the quality of what we're producing, honestly. So once one of my good colleagues said, you know, it will make you look good on your resume. Does it really matter? I mean, so I think you're, you're touching on something, uh, Matt, in that, that is so important. Quality and does it really matter? Yes, in terms of uh, your own promotion, the number game, we go through the same thing and it will allow you to get promoted from assistant to associate and then eventually to full prep, fine. But I think ultimately you have to ask yourself in terms of, has it really made a difference so meaning the ultimate responsibility of what we do, what you do in this research area is vested right in here. You have to feel good about it. So, and as I said recently, and I was lucky enough to kind of do that and we made a difference, a lot of difference in terms of, let's say, you know, helping some of these practitioners, even in our classes, I do uh, honors, uh, class, but I have mixed students from accounting, management, marketing, management science, hospitality, sport, and they do all real applications. To me, that's one area in terms of where we're lacking and then we have to focus more on. I hope there could be a little bit more uh, uh, support for us, even in a country like Turkey. Once a good friend of mine, I'm not going to mention his name, most of you know the person is a well-established scholar, when he went to the one of this um, big uh, government, uh, I'm not going to mention where, uh, places, and he was told whether you do research or not, we will still get visitors. You see, that that's the, the mentality is a little bit uh, different here. So why do we research or why do we do research and how could uh, our research findings uh, be of some help to someone? So to me, we have to really spend some quality time on this now. That's just one aspect of this uh, really uh, big question you have. In terms of, let's say, uh, futuristic uh, orientation or changes, I'm not futurist, but all I can say is this. In this educational space, at least as I see it here in the States, being an administrator, having reviewed a number of programs worldwide, I can say this thing. Uh, there will be some new changes areas where we have to introduce new courses. Some of our students in hospitality and tourism are employed by non-traditional hospitality and tourism areas. 
as you know, of course, you know, going, let's say 200 miles an hour, we can be hit this concrete wall, right? Because of this virus and everything came to a halt. So they changed the whole world. And of course, as a result of this, now we may say we have to have a maybe more of heightened interest in bringing crisis manage management into our classes, disaster management, whatever the sources this crisis might be, uh, whether it's a typical virus as we experience the pandemic, or let's say natural disaster, or even a man-made, you know, man cause, you know, disaster, let's say terrorism, et cetera. So I think one of the knowledge domains has to be in this area of let's say, crisis management, safety, and security in a very uh, concerted way to bring the importance of that out in our curriculum as we do data analytics, information technology being part of our curriculum, right? Same thing, by the same token, you know, you can also uh, uh, focus on, let's say, and this is also important, uh, as we do sustainability, quality of life, and another like knowledge domain area. So meaning the so-called uh, vocational or application-oriented skills are good. I think as we have become a little bit more sophisticated, we need to push the envelope to bring some of these new areas into our curricular activities or curriculum so that you know the kind of program we have is much richer than it would have been so far. So we know in our own experience that Oracle comes to us to hire people as they hire people from management science. Same thing Google and uh, last semester before you know we became remote and we had our representative from Boston. They wanted to hire some of our people. So they may hire people from management who can do computing algorithm, you know, this, that, but they also have people who, who, who come from hospitality tourism who may have the skills. So meaning they, they, this kind of non-traditional areas become more important. So I guess some of this may be uh, the classic um, uh, areas of knowledge we have domain should be also uh, reflective of the changes we're observing. I know, you know, we don't respond uh, fast enough to changes in the marketplace because things take longer in academic world. But I think we really have to just uh, have a shell, some sort of seminar, and we bring some of those, you know, key issues and skill sets into our teaching. That's more of like what I envision for for in the future. We will have some of those. Another area that we neglect terribly is um, you can say. Um, uh, travel and medicine. I know there is a journal, Journal of Travel Medicine, which has been around for a long time, but I know in the USA, a couple of programs have uh, uh, individuals who specialize in tropical disease and travel. I think that's, again, part of safety issue because I don't think any of our programs that I know of have that kind of knowledge domain defined. You know, you have someone, a faculty member, this is your specialization, focus on, you know, let's say tropical disease and travel is huge, it's big. So, you know, if you travel somewhere that you've never been to in the Amazon region, what is it that you need to know in terms of vaccination, things like this. So we are we're not informing, you know, some of these people in a way that we should. Of course, part of it is, is in the area of uh, medical field, but part of the other is in public health area. So there is that interfacing going on with public health in general. So we have to have, some of those new areas as part of our teaching and um, curriculum areas. But um, in order to answer, uh, not answer, reflect to your, or you know, talk about the question in a broader way, let me just make a couple of the observations that emanated from the big overhead I had, but I didn't touch on. Just maybe I can uh, point out a couple of things. So, it is true that our credibility has uh, gone up over the past, you know, 50, 60 years. We have become a legitimate, you know, uh, sector. We do matter, okay? Uh, this is good. Uh, but one thing is clear, I guess, uh, we all know this up until 1980s, North America, that includes USA, Canada, and Australia, New Zealand, uh, probably dominated the research, right? Academic research in our field, but from, the early 1990s up until let's say present time, I guess this dominating has been shaking, right? So 
even you look at you know quality papers that come from Turkey, I would say Turkey would be in the top ten you know list or fifteen. So in terms of you know uh, academic work that is being generated, so meaning now I guess um, still you may argue that the USA you know probably you know had the uh, the highest number of pubs and tourism journals followed by China, et cetera. But I think a country like Turkey, where tourism is, in my mind, advanced, is also top of that list. So we have seen uh, a regional shift in this regard. You know, Turkey plays a role as well. But what we don't see is, you know, still, you know, a country like African continent, you know, maybe select places, South Africa, you know, is a little bit more visible. But uh, uh, not as strongly visible. Same thing you can argue for uh, South America and Latin America. Okay, we don't really see a huge, you know, let's say amount of, uh, let's say, uh, research coming out of that part of the world and it's scattered. And even if there may be some experts, but Europe has been good. But to me, the creative, innovative uh, uh, ideas in the area of even technology and even tourism seem to come from Scandinavian places, <laughs> mostly <laughs> for the past 10 years or so. I guess, uh, and uh, uh, it's good to publish more the same in a lot of other places because we're in an uh, application oriented field, but uh, in order to be uh, on the front, I think we need to be a little bit more innovative, creative and uh, keep up what's going on and add to it. I think in that regard, um, uh, we see, you know, really, uh, uh, powerful research coming from the Scandinavian countries. Uh, and uh, I would also include, let's say, Spain and Portugal. You know, they are also ahead in this area. But I think in the USA, it's uh, not as strong as it used to maybe because there's so much change over, over the years where we have new players that dominate the direction of tourism. But still, we're talking to each other more than so talking to our practitioners. I think uh, maybe, uh, you know, being an active researcher, and I, I, I don't really just talk about this thing, you know, from the perspective of me being a researcher, but I usually talk about this thing from the perspective of being a member of society and how we can really do uh, things that will improve the well-being of our stakeholders. I think we have to also have a totally different uh, uh, perspective to doing research, what would matter. So publishing in good journals or high impact journals uh, would not allow you to do high impact in the field. So I think that's important. Now, of course, we have more publication outlets, no question. And as of 2012, we had hundreds some, now we have you know, 150. So where do you know, uh, publish your research, okay, in terms of your future uh, research? And uh, if you look at some of the things we do in general, um, we still use, you know, one dependent variable, try to explain a given phenomenon. But in reality, you know, I guess we have more than, you know, one dependent variables. We still make, let's say, our um, so-called uh, inferences based on averages we obtain our studies. Yet, you know, some of these companies don't care about your average. Marriott, you know, it's not going to care if the average satisfaction score is five. They have a scale one to ten. If it's not 9.5, you're not a good manager, period. But so the point is that, so you see how we even analyze our data is important. In the future, one of the things, we have seen some uh, uh, signs of this, we're gonna look at distribution of responses and slice them. So we're gonna analyze the same dependent variable with 25% of that distribution, 75% of that distribution and see how things shift and change because we cannot just continue to make inferences based on basic averages. That's not gonna really translate well into practice at all. I think there is really a shift away from that kind of analysis. I know Arch Woodside has talked about this thing. One of our colleagues here, Albert Asaf, has done a couple of papers looking at some of these things. So, um, uh, we have to be aware of uh, you know this. Even the outliers in the distribution could make a big difference, which we ignore. Even the ones you know who may be extremely satisfied with the experience or not satisfied, if it's a matter of magnitude, because emphasizing niche marketing, individualized service, you cannot ignore those outliers in your research as we did before because that would bring you again back to that zone of you know, indifference where you look at averages, 
If you ask yourself, who is this average consumer? Who is this average traveler? Who is, there, who is this average recreationist? I mean, ask that question yourself. So you're not gonna get average scores will give you average knowledge. Average knowledge is not gonna improve your decision making. I see that being one of the things that will really will impact our future research, how we look at distribution of responses and how you analyze it in terms of your dependent variables, hopefully multiple dependent, multiple independent variables. So I think we have the same questions today, but the answers are gonna be quite different. So the other issue is, of course, we know this thing um, that um, uh, as alluded to, I think I said, uh, we have seen this shift toward more active, engaging, innovative and co-created tourism and hospitality experiences. So meaning whatever we do at this time may appeal to high order needs of participants because this is extremely important so most of the destinations compete today on the basis of their added value, not whether they have you know, flashing toilet or running water. That was in the 60s, 70s, 90s. So I guess the kind of uh, uh, consumer we will see in the future will be what? The type that will demand a lot and will pay for it, but at the same time, you know, would be part of that consumption and production, like being part of that what co-creation process. So I think there will be more focus on uh, individual uh, uh, contribution to that production, meaning uh, even places, destinations will figure out, you know, how you can configure the use of operant and operant resources because we have very sophisticated consumers who have interests different motivation and knowledge and skills, which they will bring into that, creating their own experience, which we call operant resources. The, the question is how would places, destinations with their operant, with a D, you know, resources could really make this possible. So I think we haven't really done, uh, you know, a lot of work in that use of our own resources, not the money and time. I'm talking about skills as being your new resource, your own interest, your level of knowledge. All that would be new resources, which we call operant with a T resources. And how those resources are aligned with destinations where providers may use their operant resources, serving as a facilitator bringing the two together, I think there will be a little bit more research happening in this area in the future, as far as I am concerned. So we do understand, let's say, the antecedents. Uh, we also understand the outcome of, let's say, decision-making process. But I think we have not really spent as much time what's going on in the middle, meaning what is being cooked, shaped, and created. That means even if we shy away from case studies, place depend, dependent case studies. In the future, we will see if we want to contribute a little bit more to society, I think we're going to do a lot of things at the local level where we can create, make a difference. Some of the research you do at the local level may not lead to a good journal, but still it will just create, make a big difference at the local level, meaning it will somehow help in improving, let's say, someone's well-being as a stakeholder. So I think we will come back to, 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 to those, let's say, uh, local studies because 90% of the things we do in tourism may take place at the local level. So a lot of things we do, you know, in terms of our research in aggregate, you know, talk about, uh, you know, at a level where the findings, you know, don't really make much sense. One example, uh, you may have done something like this in my PhD class, and we looked at, we picked one journal, that was Journal of Travel Research. And let's take a look at, we said, all the segmentation studies in the past 10, 15 years. Get, guess what? We'll zero in on their conclusion. Most of the conclusion sections of this articles talk about the same thing. Yes. How could that be possible? So the point is this, because it is very generic finding and it just then they bring this, put it on the shelf and that's the end of it. And no one is gonna use this thing unless it is what? 
contextualized to a given place where it can be used to make a difference. So you do the same thing again, like how many more segmentation studies we're gonna see from Japan? We don't do it as much. Now we're gonna do it about Chinese market or Indian market uh, down the road because maybe uh, in the next 10 years, we're gonna do so many segmentation studies about Brazilian travelers, because this is not a joke. We've seen this one, <laughs> you know, Japanese market and look at early on in the late 80s, early 90s, you can see tons of studies looking at what Japanese market. Now we're looking at Chinese, most of the group, then we're independent. We don't do a lot of German travelers. So you can see, I guess, as new nations become affluent so that they can afford to travel a little bit and we do their travel studies focusing on individuals. I think that's, that's important, but we should also focus on tourism as a social phenomenon uh, to make a difference for those who are not part of the consumption and production of tourism. Meaning, because this is the larger question, you know, would tourism activities improve well-being? I think there will be a lot of new studies in the future where, where researchers will have to make the connection between so-called tourism activities and how they are linked to non-economic values of consumption, meaning subjective well-being. One of the things we haven't seen is this. We talk so much about sustainability indicators, but how those indicators are connected to outcome variables empirically. We haven't done much research in that area. This could be at the local level for a resort, could be a cluster of resort in a region. So what is the connection? And, but in conversation and uh, in terms of uh, justification, make a case. If you practice more of the sustainability business and you're likely to get, you know, what people who enjoy, uh, you know, let's say being environmentally sensitive and so it's a more of a, you know, value proposition and, and will help you bring in more, but empirically, okay, those connections have to be made, okay? Saying if you do this kind of practice, would that improve your ARD or uh, would that improve your sales or profitability using some of these accounting or finance indicators? So we haven't really done much research in that regard the connection. We talk so much about developing indicators. How are they connected to different aspects of quality of life issues as we see in tourism? I think it's a tremendous area. So as much as we deal some of this, you know, let's say uh, event-based, you know, crisis, those are just maybe temporary periodicals, okay, they will come and they have their ups and downs. But I think in order to generate uh, more useful and consistent knowledge, I, I invite us to really just focus on some of uh, these uh, uh, things that I was alluding to, connecting our uh, outcome variables to more non-traditional, let's say, outcome variables, our input variables to non-traditional. I guess, you know, you've seen tons of studies where we look at loyal to satisfaction, satisfaction as personal outcome variable, maybe loyalty as management outcome variable, but how would that, would loyalty be better predicted if you go through my subjective well-being or uh, well-being of a stakeholder? If you understand that, and would that really just give us a little bit more support for tourism development? Those are really legitimate good questions to make a better policy statement. Because if anything I learned from this so-called application-oriented project that I was part of, you know, when you talk about how would what we do influence society, that's a good uh, narrative to be shared. And that resonates well with people. Otherwise, you can always just create another paper, write another thing. It's just, you know, endless. And believe me, within five years, what we did as good article, no one looks at it. Yeah. It may give you a couple of the things. So anyway, I'm a little bit all over. Uh, I know in terms of, you know, some of the areas like what to expect in our future direction research. I think we're going to be hard pressed to make that kind of connection, like tying our um, uh, indicators to uh, non-economic value of our consumption, meaning, you know, higher order needs, well-being, 
and then how they will improve, let's say, performance indicators, however we define them. So we're going to see uh, more uh, uh, studies at the local level where you will see this uh, stronger connections uh, being made. Okay. Thank you, uh, Muzovel. As we know, tourism is also a part of social sciences. And uh, Jaffa, when he launched his journal, Analysis of Tourism Research, he has always promoted the journal as a part of social sciences. So, you know, there was also a specific section for the journal when we submitted the paper. It says, what would be your contribution to social sciences other than, you know, tourism uh, research? So, uh, Okay, there are some good, you know, uh, progress in terms of, you know, making collaboration with other with, with the people from other you know, disciplines and so on. So what can we, also there are some other additional uh, good evidence that uh, uh, tourism journals are also cited by non-tourism journals. So we have started, you know, to export uh, the knowledge that we produce in tourism journals to other journals out of our field. And as you know, I think you do, did this mostly, you know, until uh, early this century, we mostly, you know, borrowed different theories, subjects from other uh, fields and, uh, and we imported them to, you know, uh, uh, to tourism, you know, uh, to, uh, uh, to develop the field of tourism research. So in the future, what kind, and you also personally, I, just you mentioned that you, also collaborated with uh, this uh, Professor Sergi, you know, when you studied the, the connection between tourism and quality of life and so on. So what could be your advice, uh, Muzo, you know, for, for us, for the, you know, tourism scholars to make tourism research stronger or to have a stronger position in social sciences? Okay, perhaps you can collaborate with more people and so on, but that, that, that could be some other things to do. Okay, uh, one of the things we've seen over the years, if you go back like 10, 15 years ago, some of the papers we have seen in any field will have maybe a single authorship at max to a mm -hmm. Now, if you look at, uh, for example, even in the area of tourism and especially in science, right? I'm talking about social science, natural science. You know, if you're part of a lab, right? And biology lab or biochemistry lab, you may be part of a team of 20, 30 people, including, you know, and young faculty members, etc. Then you see this paper published in Science Journal with 25 names on it. So even in, 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 in the area of tourism now, uh, we don't mind just, you know, having like three or four paper on a pa uh, names on a paper, you know, whether you just publish it, you know, single author, okay, fine. But I think all that uh, signify or just suggests or implies this, I think some of the things we have done, as you alluded to, Metin, has become so sophisticated that you know we need this uh, some sort of cross discipline interdisciplinary approach as we always say tourism is right i mean to really just uh, bring solutions to our problem i think if you were to if you don't understand let's say you may understand the flow of let's say i'm just thinking about how airmb is created so you know we had this uh, people let's say david levy who was uh, now their uh, strategy you know a uh, person who came from hospitality, knew the business, but others may know the you know, flow of that uh, uh, solution, let's say someone who's a programmer, someone who's an analyst, but someone who knows the nom domain, knowledge, the business, right? So we need each other, I guess. In that regard, yeah, we team up, we collaborate, and then if you wanted the blockchain now, you have to really have someone who is a mathematician and computer scientist who understands tourism if you want to apply this to food area. And that's not unusual, right? So there is that kind of cross fertilization over the years. And it is true that our pool of knowledge has gone big enough to tap into our own. We have developed good enough knowledge. Others do use that pool of knowledge. And you look at management science journal, marketing journals, and I see some of our names uh, being cited. That is correct. Nevertheless, uh, the issue remains um, that when we do research, I and mean, then we have to make sure that whatever we say or generate kind of draws on the uniqueness and importance of what we do in the field of tourism and hospitality. 
meaning we should be proud of what we represent. As was the case because they did it here, let me do it here. They have it there, let me do it here. I think if you craft the story within our own space, tourism, we have to believe in the uniqueness of what we represent. Once that case has been made, then what is the best way of you know, attacking, addressing this issue? If I need a computer scientist, I'll bring that into it. If I need someone in planning, I'll bring that person from planning. If I need someone from marketing, that should be the approach, not the other way around. I think I say this because over the past, let's say 40 years or so, 50 some years, like five decades, we have come a long way. We have good skills, we have good pull of knowledge. We have generated a lot of good knowledge. Therefore, we should be able to make the case in a way where we display our credibility. Because anytime a PhD student say, well, I wanna date this thing, I like to do this thing, that discourages me. I said, just let's talk about the uniqueness of what is it that you're trying to do first, right? And look, otherwise, how else, you know, 90% of IT applications would be in travel and tourism space. Look at some of these things. The person who created the Airbnb is a you know a mighty and then was computer, but they team up with people in hospitality to make the case. That's my point. Why would then you know Oracle as they did last semester before we went off this remote whatever platform, they came to us. The representative told me from Boston they hired the highest number of students from management science and hospitality. This is Oracle. You wonder why that is the case. No need to get into that connection. The point is this, we do have some unique things. Yes, you can just take finance, this is that, but we're looking at something that is so unique, so different. I think we should be proud of what we represent in tourism and hospitality. Then see how else we can resolve some of these issues bring the best solution we can to the table. How are we gonna do that? By probably you know, teaming up with people who have different expertise because tourism issues have become so complicated and sophisticated in terms of application that you know, just like any other field, that's what we're gonna have multiple authorship. That's one of the trends you see when you look at you know, changes over time. They have four, five, six people, that's fine, it's allowed. And you can see it is more so in science, you know, biochemistry, biology, life sciences, like 15, 20, 18 people are part of one little paper. So uh, I, I, I guess um, this, this, you know, teaming up collaboration, but, you know, it's always good to be part of a project from the beginning. Uh, sometimes they will bring on, you know, okay, we're doing this thing. That's just more of a help that which I understand. But if you want to do something and enjoy it, and it would be good to create that uh, uh, project from the beginning together collectively. And, 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 and usually when I have, you know, we hired, let's say someone like Dr. Ram, you know, she was with the module for 10 years and her area is information technology application. And she's teaming up with uh, two people, one in computer science, the other is from mathematics. And then she's doing something on blockchain as it applies to let's say food, because I, you know, that's the whole thing. So those people don't understand, you know, what goes into, you know, this sustainable food chain, you know, from the farmer to our table. How could you ensure that, you know, there will be a high level of, you know, safety and security in the distribution of uh, raw meat? just to make a point. So for that one, we make the case, this is what we deal with in terms of food and distribution of food and why this is so important to the well-being of you know, consumers in order to make this safer, you know, who, who, who am I gonna you know, team up with? Because you're gonna team up with people who does this computer programming and also understand whatever the algorithm. So, so that's a natural, what, uh, uh, I guess, uh, a partnership, uh, uh, Otherwise, I guess, um, as I said, you know, they did this thing, let's do it in marketing they have. Now you can ask yourself uh, in terms of uh, uh, advancement we may have made, okay? We have made good progress understanding demand for travel and tourism. I think that line of research is strong. 
we do have a good research and motivation decision making in terms of tourism consumer behavior, very strong. And then let's say someone like Professor Kozak is part of that uh, group. I think that's very strong, okay? So we do have, let's say, policy related issues. So you can make cases like this, like segmented portion or aspect of the pool of tourism knowledge. We have strong dominant areas that will continue and technology cuts across all, definitely, but I think uh, as I said, we have to really just uh, tap into the uniqueness of what we do, uh, knowing that we have developed you know, skills in marketing, planning, and whatever the field of application or whatever the field of classic field, you know. So we may be grounded in economics. You look at even uh, uh, some of these uh, studies released in China and published in some of, some of the reputable journals. Guess what? One of the major topics, like 50, 60 percent of the topics uh, research topics uh, that came in China for the past 15, 20 years, what about economics? You know what that tells you? Anytime you kind of uh, look at trace the evolution of a field, you have to justify your existence because that's how it was in the 60s. Like, you know, we have this many people came, therefore give us a little bit more money for our promotional, whatever program, right? So justification. Now you look at, you know, topics, same thing, I've seen at least 15 papers in Turkey in different journals published looking at what? Nucleometric issues yes. in the area of this, in the area of that. And I remember Nazmi Kozak, Professor Nazmi Kozak was probably one of the first one who really did a very extensive uh, nucleometric whatever study of thesis and dissertations. I remember, uh, and I think it was published maybe in Anatolia, one of those, and I read that thing, but uh, he also, I had a chance once he and I were talking and then it was very comprehensive. Those are useful, but recently I've seen like this so many in food, in this, and I mean, so far. Right, yes, specific journals, yes. Right, and then I think, but those are good, but I think in some cases, one of the things I, I, I would discourage us not to do it uh, as much is because the technique is so good, we can use this meta-analysis and do this meta-analysis for this, for that to see, you know, knowledge evolution, which is fine. But I think those are always li uh, limited by the number of studies you can bring into it. If you do a good meta-analysis as was done for demand studies, that makes sense. And it did make sense. We've seen a couple of this. If you want to do something on motivation because the pool of knowledge in that area is so rich, then that would make sense. But, you know, we don't want to just chip in, <laughs> I guess, right? <laughs> the quality of what we do, because it can be done in that fashion with 20 studies and do something on convention, for example. But uh, anyway, the thing is just, let's just be proud of what we have and understand the uniqueness of what we do. and. The uniqueness comes from the way we contribute to society's well-being. That was my punchline. You're asking about this thing in terms of being, so what do we mean by that? If you cannot contribute to social science, if you cannot make a difference in society, you're not contributing much. You're not gonna be valued. For me, that would be one of the key indicators of contributing something. Therefore, we can just say, yeah, we're part of that social science, you know, group. We contribute to well-being of stakeholders. If your work, what we do, does not contribute to our well-being advancement, then I think it's not valued. Okay, Muzavala, I think there is also a kind of, you know, similar question uh, that you have already responded uh, to question by Seda Karagios. She says, well, she has published a PhD, uh, she did a PhD on the use of blockchain technology in tourism. The question is, uh, given the nature of the future of tourism, do you think such interdisciplinary studies can bring any challenges or advantages, I think, for, for research? I think, if anything, that would be one of the areas we may see more research. It's so important in today's world to me. I think there is tremendous potential. I'm just simply uh, saying this because based on my you know, we get a lot of recruiters they talk about and then my interaction, I compliment her. I think, the, you know, people who want to do, you know, chain, um, blockchain. Here is, here is the question. I know that uh, China and Japan uh, uh, did a good agreement on this. So important what we end up having on our table to eat. So in terms of one of the key issues when we say security and safety that touches not just only us, 
being safe and secure. Also, what we consume food, how safe is the food? Blockchain can allow us, you can get your menu with the code when we know this thing, you can just read that thing, it will tell you where the source of that particular, you know, food generated, the farm, the distribution, all that. Having that kind of safety embedded in the distribution system of, let's say, food will be extremely important for our restaurant business, food chain, whatever, because it secures what safety, it knows where to put the blame on in case something happens, whether it is originated from this place, that place, or from this distributor, that none of these people can do anything bad that will just produce, you know, less quality food for our table. That's just one area, like securing the sustainable, safe, secure, high quality food. You will know the source of it at your table. This can be made possible by use of, you know, blockchain is part of it because the integration will allow us to really trace that. The same thing applies to a lot of other things, could be your hotel room even. So in a way, when we say, you know, contributing something good to society, I believe that, you know, whoever, you know, acts on it and uses this in a big way in the field of tourism, in the area of food, travel distribution, think about like, you know, how group travel is being done from the origin all the way to the destination, including ground handling. So you have so many different steps and some of the steps faces will take some share of that pie. So what is it that we can do to make sure that this uh, seamless you know, transaction will take place in case something happens, you know, the, it's, the chain is broken, who would be to blame, to what extent, financially and morally? Some of those things can easily be uh, made safer by this kind of research. We haven't seen a lot in that area, but I'm pretty sure, you know, this will require a good teaming up. And then I know when we're in Eskisha area, there was that nice presentation, right? Uh, I guess uh, I can see Sela is uh, shaking her hand. And, yeah, so it was really interesting, but I think there will be tremendous potential in that area, no question. And then uh, some of you who are in that should definitely just team up with others in different fields to do, you know, something really good. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Well, please feel free to send us your questions. Even you can uh, uh, open your microphone and uh, ask the question in person. Well, uh, I have a question from Ferial, but I think it's not very uh, related to, to research. But anyway, do you think uh, the tourism faculties, the tourism schools in US carry out any environmentally sensitive, environmentally friendly activities and education? This is the question to you. What, what was the key thing? I, I just. The environmentally friendly activities uh, in your schools in US. You mean in terms of like during this COVID uh, time or? Well, could be, uh, or in terms of sustainability using these sources, uh, or I think uh, uh, perhaps she might be asking if you have, you know, anything to teach in your, in your, in your schools about this sustainability or environment? So, uh, you know, if you look at our, because as you know, we have a PhD program and you get a PhD in management. We are part of the uh, Eisenberg School of Management where we have seven departments. So they're one of those maybe five, six unit programs. And uh, so we don't have a large PhD program. We take only two and they come in as a cohort of uh, 14 students. So it's really nice. Yes, so you get to manage the program here and that's how it works. So very, very competitive. But uh, one of the things we do, we have a faculty member and that's a big buzzword very then yeah i mean we teach for example next semester we have a phd seminar and where we may have five students or four but um two of the modules are about sustainability because the goal is to introduce students to different aspects of you know what's going on but sustainable is one of those uh, important knowledge domains for us and uh but um uh 
so that's one area. The other, of course, we have performance area and you know quality of life, and we have all that and technology component now because we have a new faculty member. Not that we didn't do technology, but uh, we have designated individual in those knowledge domains. We try to promote at the graduate level because we're in business. Uh, our students, you know, get a PhD in management, uh, not in hospitality. So. And they may go to business school, they may go to hospitality programs, house in different places. So, but um, in terms of my own uh, uh, program, we have strong connection to industry. I mean, extremely big. Uh, we have now our 46 um, uh, HDM carrier day, and this is, uh, you know, of course, we advise them, but uh, managed and uh, run by our students, and they are going to have it virtually on the 23rd of February. We usually get 60 to 65 companies because our placement rate is very high, nine to five percent. So meaning we graduate 100, 150 some students and then 90 to 95 percent will already have a job, you know, like before graduation. And we have a very strong advisory board where I keep 28 industry people and we have three meetings, you know, a year, you know, and two of which take place in Boston, one of which has a reception at the UMass uh, Boston Club, we have a club in Boston. And then, so it's very involved. We also do a reception in New York before hotel show, usually in November. So uh, I know uh, Dr. Keskin is there and once we hooked up there, right, Mohammed? Uh, and so um, anyway, we have a lot of activities uh, for the program for students. Our key thing is to make sure that our students are connected to industry. And even during this COVID time, and we managed to have like uh, five, you know, webinars so that, you know, we will have industry leaders, you know, just like this, you know, talking to our students. And that was fun. So we have regular faculty meetings. We continued and we're going to continue to do our virtual webinars next semester so that, you know, our first year students who came in like first year, you know, I mean, they were remote and second semester. Now they are sophomores. So even I don't know most of our students at this time who started the program, right? So, but the, our goal is, uh, what do you do to maintain that good engagement connection? Not only to faculty, us, because they can get to see when we teach classes, but also to phases of our industry leaders, because through our annual banquet, where we bring 400 people, and this is our fundraising activity, and then uh, the trip advisor, the founder, uh, Offer, for example, he, he got our award. So we give industry award and they are all uh, well organized and we also make good money from it. And then we canceled that thing last March, but now we're gonna have a hybrid one. We rescheduled that thing for June. So we usually get you know, 350, 400 uh, attendees and our students will be maybe just some will join us, but we sell tables to Marriott, you name it, all this big companies in the USA, they show up in Boston, it's huge. So all that is done because uh, the connection to industry is so important to us because we don't advertise all this. If you get into our website under alumni, you will see all these picture activities, but you don't get to see this thing when you zoom into our uh, department's webpage, but this is not exception. So other schools do the same thing because being an applied field will ask you to remain connected. I think this could have been or was or has been a challenge for us during the COVID time, right? How do you, what do you do to ensure that the connection is still there, the excitement is still there, the passion is still there because our industrial leaders are helping us, you know, raise money for our scholarships. So that's so, so important. So uh, I think personally, like uh, if I reflect on my own, I spend a lot of time with engagement actually, as much as forget the research. And I teach only one class, which is a honors class. You have to be in honors college, meaning you have to have certain GPA to be in that class. It's a very small class. They do a undergraduate research thesis and then you can have people from any major, but mostly limited to our own people and very time consuming. Even at this time, once a week, we meet this students because they take it two semester, even if we are on holiday, but we still manage to meet them even on the weekend, Saturday, Sunday. One of my PhDs went to Russia. And then, so even if there's a time difference, we make things happen. I think we spend a lot of 
quality time with students, uh, and also quality time with our industry leaders to kind of maintain that uh, connection with industry. I'm sure those of us who teach in the USA, including uh, Dr. Keskin, and then this is so important to have that strong connection to industrial world, and which we do. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, students on campus could not engage in their what club activities. We also have five different clubs housed in our program. These are all professional clubs. We have honors club, but uh, you know they still manage to have virtual interaction and meeting, and then um, so. But um, it's it's been very interesting, and I I hope that you know things will change starting maybe March and by fall 2021. We will have this new normal maybe and then see you know how we do thereafter but uh, uh, it has financial consequences as well okay well i think there are no questions uh, let me ask one more question to you uh, again about the future of tourism education so as we know there are you know uh, in the last 30 40 years there have been a number of you know schools tourism schools tourism departments almost well not in all countries but in the majority of countries there are at least one tourism department once you know school specifically educating you know uh, you know the, the, the people for the industry also for the academia so the, we have also a number of you know um, phd programs now uh, you know graduating uh, young scholars to to you know take positions in different universities so what, how can you see the future of these schools, you know, the education, uh, Muzo? So do we need such a big number of, you know, schools, departments, or such a big number of PhD graduates? So how can we manage to, to accommodate them, you know, either in the, in, the, in the industry or in the academia? This is a really very, very good question. And, and, and it's an important question given the situation we're all in at this time let me give you just a little snapshot of what's going on in the usa other than schools that are located in urban areas such as university of las vegas unlv university of houston located in houston um, and university of central florida in orlando and these are schools that are located in urban areas guess what their enrollments okay enrollment figures have been stable and maybe they experience a little bit increase because they are big programs the rest, most of the other programs, including our own, for the past two and a half years have seen decline in enrollments in undergraduate hospitality tourism programs. This is a fact, but this could be attributed to a number of things. One being that there's a demographic shift going on in the country, meaning the pool of college bound students, meaning high school graduates have been shrinking but this will change again. So meaning even applications to colleges have gone down because of this demographic change or shift. That's something we have to keep in mind. So, and then unlike in Turkey, let's say in the USA, people can choose which school they wanna go. So what do you do to make your major so attractive so that people can find this field very enjoyable. Let me give you, let's say we have over 400 students. Guess what? 10 of 10% 10 of our students have double majors. One of our, one of, one of my favorite students, because she's leading this uh, uh, HTM career day, has double major. Her primary major is hospitality, second major is finance. That's a deadly good combination. Okay. So we have almost 40 people who have double majors. Management science, HTM, marketing, HTM. Usually marketing is finance. We have accounting finance. This is good. So meaning these people are as competent as they can be. If you choose to be in hospitality tourism, what is it that we can do for them to make this program attractive, right? So that's another thing. There's, there's like value proposition. What is it that we craft for them so that parents can find this program major worth of investment because it cost them a lot of money to send their kids to school, right? So we're gonna see, so this kind of, you know, concern, so meaning competition has gone up. We have more, you're right, number of programs that offer, 
you know, undergraduate and even graduate programs. But some of the programs I know cut their master's program. And they focus on their PhDs, but they move their PhD master programs in urban areas. A good example would be Virginia Tech has it different. And we're gonna have it in, uh, let's say Boston, but the PhD is the only one we keep it on campus. So I guess uh, schools are pressed to really generate programs that will serve as revenue generation, rev gen programs, meaning they have to generate money because uh, if you, 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 may, you may not have that pressure, but we do. So we cannot afford to have less students in our program because that's a money issue. So, and so the question is, do we need as many people as we have right now, or there will be some demand for our graduates in the future. We know that um, I think our industry has been hit the hardest as a result of this COVID-19 pandemic, right? It's clearly, and we know that uh, from our uh, observations and different studies, anecdotal evidence, et cetera, that it will take a couple of years for this industry to rebound. Right, but when and we have seen this thing happening in the past, the Great Recession in the late twenties, let's say twenty nine, and then first energy crisis, second energy crisis, let's say the nine eleven, etc. You look at some of these, you know, regional global, let's say disasters, or um, how would I say, uh, yeah, um, uh, shifts. I guess. Our programs, meaning hospital tourism rebound, just came back stronger than ever before. I think knowing what we do and desire we see in people and this globalization and the shrinking nature of you know, our world, I think there will be some demand for you know, providing activities for which you have to have some trained individuals. So the question is, how can you make your program viable and uh, let's say survive within business school system? Because as you know, uh, I guess those of you who know the system in the USA, we have programs housed in different places here. We are housed in business school. That means uh, there's pressure on us. You know, even getting into our business school, you know, is not as easy as maybe getting into some other majors. So this is not the case for other programs where you have 15, you know, 100 students, 16. And so that's not us, for example, or some of the smaller programs. So you can say there is elitism attached to it very, very strongly. So, but our recruiters will know that too, because we have no, you know, problem of placing our students with good companies. But the question would be, for a program to survive, in my mind, we need to be known for something. As you know, Cornell is no more, let's say, revenue management, et cetera. Now we're moving into that space a little bit, maybe performance, quantitative skills. You have to, not a generic hospitality program, just like any other program, but a program that bring out something to the market that is so unique and identifiable. I think that's something we have to really just you know, focus on to create that narrative to parents because you know, we have a couple of, let's say, uh, orientations just you know, here, college bound students with their parents with the school. So we do a lot for them so that we can just convince them that you know, this is worth of your investment. You know, they can do this, they can move up and then you know, make this much money, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a legitimate sector. So, I think we are still, uh, you know, hard pressed to really make the case to parents because parents in the end will pay for their education. It's not just, you know, you go to college, but you know, what program major you will do and then how you're gonna recoup your investment, you know, upon graduation, are you gonna get a good job, a good paying job? So there will be that pressure, but the good thing, I'm a, you know, positive guy. And even if this two years will be hard for us, but I'm pretty sure, our students will be in high demand, not only by traditional you know, areas of employment as they are trained for, but also non-traditional areas of employment. For example, senior living management space is important. As I said, Oracle, like high tech companies, hire our own students for their, let's say, service skills, where they can put these people in front of their customers, okay? Even if you have the back of the house, you know, things go on 
more of let's say technology based uh, development that space does not allow those people to be the front face so usually you know some of these technology companies prefer and like to have hospitality students in, as their front people so that's why they hire us so we have to go out into those places where we make that connection with recruitment to kind of you know expand let's say just job recruitment or hiring areas for our students, but we have to be always competitive and be proactive. We cannot just, you know, in our case, sit still and hoping that students will come to us. For the past two years, we have been proactive. And, you know, I sent faculty members to these regional conferences. We do these webinars and inform them, talk and do things that will make us a little bit more visible and competitive. This is for domestic market. You do the same thing for your international market. So, I mean, uh, there, it's a challenge. It's a challenge uh, uh, because students here, you know, prefer uh, pick their major. You know, they are not uh, coming to us by default because they just took the exam and therefore they are now in school. That's not the case. So really we, we feel that pressure and they pay for it. We have to justify our existence. But as I said, the good thing is that our future is still bright. I really mean this. I think we are hospitality strong. And then if we maintain the uniqueness of what we represent and be proud of what we do, I think our students will excel and uh, you know do well. And then there will be demand for their skills, no question. Okay, Muzi, thank you very much. Well, we have only 20 minutes for your next meeting. So it's, I think, better to finish here, stop here. Uh, thank you all the information that you have provided to us, Muzo. Well, thank you for, for everything. Thank you. If I don't know, I think we have a little bit more time, but I, if I have, uh, because I, I didn't follow up and kept up with the uh, questions in the chat, I hope uh, if uh, we haven't covered anything, I wonder if we can let the, the audience, anyone wants to ask his or her question, they can do so because so. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. There is no question from our future. I'm just trying to follow it now. Could you please specify operant and operant in terms of tourism? What it means operant? Usually uh, they overlap, but these are just types of, uh, these are terms used to describe, let's say, types of resources we have. It's, it's, it's so important in the context of service dominant logic and co-creation. How do you, you know, co-create what we consume, right? So operant usually, but they are not mutually exclusive, refer to the things that are personal. For example, your knowledge of destinations can become your operant resource or your interest, your skills, not just simply money is my resource, not just simply you can say time is my resource, right? Those are also resources, part of, but there is more to your resources than you know your money and time that you can bring to the table. So those are consider your operant resources. And then on the other hand, when we say with the D operant resources, these are usually attributed to providers resources, providing good, clean room, or having, let's say enough staff to develop programs for your visitors, like these are recreationists or, you know, animators, whatever, who can do things for you. Or let's say, um, having, let's say, available uh, uh, programs that allow, you know, participants to enjoy. So in a way, there is overlap between the two because the knowledge of the manager could be operant resource because you've been there for 10 years, you understand your French market, you understand your um, uh, Russian market. So the idea is, if you were to be a facilitator of that experience, to be created and valued, what is it that you do to configure out that combination of resources that the providers will bring you as participants could bring to the table? Because the configuration is the one that will create whatever your, the nature of experience you're gonna have as an outcome variable or your loyalty. So, in brief, I guess we refer to this thing like resources, but we don't usually differentiate, they overlap, but at the same time, operant resources are more than 
your tangible resources, your intangible assets to some extent, your interest is that your knowledge of, you know, what you're doing, like, are you a good climber? What you bring to that climbing experience or kayaking experience is, could be part of your opponent uh, resource, which is important for the provider to know, to be aware of. Does it make sense? Hope okay? that helps. Is it okay, Arif? Akif? Sorry. Yes. I think so. Very yes. And Thank other you. questions? Uh, well, there's no question. That's okay. I think yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you, uh, Well, thank you. It's been really a pleasure. And uh, if you have uh, any questions for me, and then I guess uh, uh, you can reach out to me, and then. Uh, uh, and if you like me to share some of the things that I had, didn't get into detail, as I said, I can share this thing with uh, Professor Ratan Kozak and he can just make it available to you or okay. Professor Nazmi Kozak, both will have it. Thank you, Mr. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you also for your attending uh, the, 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 the of the, uh, Th Thanks for the opportunity. And then, yes, I do have it just so that, I mean, it is big, uh, you, you don't know this, so of course, that is the big E. Big E means uh, New England states. They have this uh, huge fair um, that happens uh, once a year and that attracts millions of visitors from all the states in New England. Each state has a house in this place. It's called the, the, the Big E. So I'm on the board of uh, this um, Big E Massachusetts building. So we have our board meeting today at 10 o'clock. So I'm attending that. It was canceled due to COVID-19 in April, unfortunately, because it generates millions of dollars. I, I'm curious now what they are gonna do hopefully next season, because this is huge and big. It's a big fair where every state, you know, will bring their best, you know, handmade, including, you know, farm products to, you know, handcrafted stuff. It's really uh, just amazing and it attracts so many uh, people. So I'm uh, very pleased that they asked me to be on the board. And so last year we did a study for them. It wasn't expected of me, but because we're, you know, I represent the education component, so free charge, and they were pleased that I can do that for them. So I'm pretty sure they are going to ask me again, you know, to do another research. And I'm not sure if I have the time to do it, but we'll see what happens at the meeting today. But anyway, so that's the meeting I'm going to attend at 10 a.m. Good. Good luck to you. Thank you all, and uh, yeah, pleasure being with you. Thanks again, Martin. Okay, yeah. next oh. we will talk about the future of social sciences this time. So <laughs> hope to see you all again uh, next uh, Tuesday at four o'clock in Turkish time. Uh, hope to see you again, yeah, okay. Good, good afternoon, good morning to you, Muzo. Thanks, bye you all. Bye-bye.